Thank you so much, and I'm, I'm really, um, really happy that I can present, um, represent Beckman Coulter Diagnostics, uh, because I think it really incorporates a lot of the things that, that we've talked about today. So my, my disclosure is just around uh, Beckman Coulter Diagnostic and, and uh, Danaher. So I really want to talk a little bit about not only the vision that Beckman Coulter Diagnostics has, to improve patients' lives and moving into where diagnostics has not been um, part of the patient journey before, but also focus a little bit of history and put it in a, in a historical perspective because I think it's really important. But first of all, I wanna ground everybody in our mission. And this is not just a, a marketing slogan. It's really something that we live um, every day. And it's to relentlessly reimagine healthcare one diagnosis at a time. And the way that we are doing this is really using both science and technology and the ingenuity and creativity and passion of our teams to move the innovation forward and to bring them closer to the patient. So as I promised, a little bit of history. And we talked quite a bit about AI, and Jeremiah had really great example where Beckman Coulter Diagnostics wants to be um, in, in patient bringing AI to the patient bedside. But I just wanted to let you know that less than 80 years ago, uh, Beckman Coulter was started by Dr. Alnard Beckman, who launched the world's first pH meter. So it was just measuring the acidity. And if you come to our offices in Brea, we celebrate that by having um, a lemon orchard because he was applying that to, um, to detect the maturation of lemons. So from lemons to chat GPT in 80 years, I mean, I don't know, my mind was like blown today. Um, the other important discovery that started this company uh, was by Dr. Wallace Coulter, and I'm sure everybody who's done any science or, or medicine knows about the Coulter Principle, uh, which it's really a way to, um, to detect and count very small particles, which today is used um, in, in, in our hematology instrument, and we've seen an example of I don't know how many, 16 million um, neutrophil measurements from, from Dr. Boothis. So that started um, in, in, uh, in the late 40s. So from there, where we are today is, is really impressive uh, because we are really trying to use all of this background and uh, the entire lifespan of technology development to move forward in, in diagnostics. And um, just last year, we have launched the new immunoassay analyzer, which really has the capabilities to detect a very small amount of proteins that can um, you know, be applied, for example, in neurodegenerative diseases, and, I, and I'll talk more about that. Um, where we are today, where Beckman is today, we are um, a leader in, um, in clinical laboratory diagnostics and, and everybody who had their blood drawn, um, probably the, the, test that, the test results that you received were made um, on, on some of the Beckman instruments and we cover everything from clinical chemistry, which is glucose, um, cholesterol, immunoassays, something like PSA testing, urinalysis, hematology, as I said before, and, and microbiology. So entire, uh, entire spectrum of, um, of clinical tests. Um, I think one, one, another important point about Beckman Coulter, and this was touched upon um, on, on all of the presentations, is access. Access to care is super important. We are available in, in about 117 countries. And what's really impressive is that uh, Beckman tests are run in, in a volume of about one million per hour. So that's a huge amount of patient lives that are saved by Beckman Coulter's um, testing. So where, what's our vision? Where, where are we going next? How can we use um, this technology and, and history to improve patients? And one of the um, diseases that Diagnostics, um, objective diagnostics has not been um, applied to is, is Alzheimer's disease and, and neurodegenerative diseases. We all know about what Alzheimer's disease is, but as I was preparing this presentation, some of the numbers that I really wanted to share are, are striking. 
So around 6.5 million Americans that are age 65 and older are living currently with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And um, there is disparity. Um, one, um, about two thirds um, of patients with Alzheimer's disease are women. Um, um, Hispanic Americans and non-Hispanic blacks are disproportionately affected by um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And um, an estimated lifetime risk, especially for women, is one in five. So I'm, I'm really afraid about myself if I wanted to be really selfish. From a societal perspective, this is an extremely costly condition and also a condition that um, affects financial health of, um, of families with, in 2021, over $271 billion has been spent by individual families for care and of, of, of Alzheimer's patients. Um, there is not enough dementia care in the United States and globally, and dementia, um, especially Alzheimer's type in, in its early stages, which is called uh, mild cognitive impairment, has not been recognized early enough so that patients can make uh, and families can make important life decisions. And in one of the um, surveys that Alzheimer's Association did, um, I was surveying the patients on when, uh, when would they want to know, would they want to know, and when would they want to know whether they do have Alzheimer's disease um, or dementia. And even, in the, even if the lack of therapies is there, uh, the majority of the patients would like to know uh, whether they have Alzheimer's disease or not very early in the diagnosis. But luckily, um, after over 20 years, we are seeing some improvements in, in disease-modifying therapies that are coming to the market that really target uh, the biology of the disease. So um, about two years ago, we had uh, first approval, first um, accelerated approval for aducanumab, and then um, early, uh, early, earlier this year, we have another drug that is targeting um, Alzheimer's disease, um, origin of the biology of the Alzheimer's disease. And it's not only showing the reduction of uh, the amyloid, which is the plaque that's accumulating in the brain of the Alzheimer's patient, but it's also showing um, slowing of cognitive decline during the eight months by 20 to 35%. So with this advent of new uh, drugs that are coming and are becoming available, there is definitely a need for an accessible and reliable way of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease and having an access to diagnostic tests that can confirm the pathology of the, this disease and identify the right patients to get the right therapies. So, how are we determining the um, Alzheimer's disease pathology today? Um, and there is definitely an evolution from cognitive testing and just looking at the patient and determining that they have cognitive decline to an objective measurement of the amyloid pathology. So the first, the first, the one way that we are doing this is by uh, PET scanning, which is uh, very accurate but it's also, um, it's also very costly. The interpretation is not easy, and, and the coverage and the payment for, um, for PET scanning is, is, is not there yet. So again, when thinking about access, this is, although this, um, this approach is, is um, you know, can detect patients, is not really um, used that much. And then about two years ago, um, there were first um, FDA cleared immunoassays that are detecting uh, the presence of amyloid from cerebrospinal fluid, but nobody really wants to get um, a lumbar puncture. So although these tests are lower cost and have kind of the same performance accuracy as PET scanning, they're not used as much. So of course there is a huge need to have a better ways of testing and blood-based testing and immunodiagnostics is really um, what the field is looking for, for moving forward um, the drugs to the patients. So um, in a perfect world, we would have a blood-based test that could replace either the PET um, imaging or CSF-based testing. 
Um, and although these less invasive and more accessible tests are coming, um, there is still um, a, a lot of things that need, we need to do to, uh, to bring that to the patient. Uh, one way of, again, looking at the blood-based testing would be to triage patients. So if the performance of the blood-based testing is not at the level where we have CSF or PET scanning, we could triage pa patients into groups where the patients who have positive or negative tests could either get the therapy or look for another causes of dementia, and just a small percentage of the patients would then go into, into PET scanning. So there are different ways that the blood-based diagnostics can be used to bring, um, to bring the, um, the needed therapies to, um, to the patients. And we know that in the last 30 years, it's been a tremendous amount of work of trying to find biomarkers that would match uh, what's happening in the brains of the Alzheimer's patients. We have a number of candidates, um, candidate proteins that um, through a lot of research has been shown that they had that are showing potential. But just to put it into a perspective how hard it is to detect um, a neurodegenerative disease that's happening in the brain, in the blood, it's looking basically at a teaspoon of sugar in, in, in a pool um, of water. So the, the technological advances that need to be done on the immunoassay detection side is really, it's really impressive. I mean, we are looking at detecting uh, concentrations of atomoles um, of proteins, and this is about 10 times lower than the most sensitive methods that are currently found in clinical laboratories. But of course, um, Beckman may have uh, potentially a solution to that, and we are seeing that some of the assays that are run on, on Beckman Coulter's immunoassay analyzer also these are not um, neurodegenerative tests, but have the potential to detect such small concentrations. And, and we, are, um, we are optimistic that these technologies that Beckman Coulter currently has can be, have, can be used to design future neurodegenerative disease assays. Um, so with that, we are thinking that not only the clinical care of the patients with Alzheimer's disease will definitely move forward, but that these tests will also speed the development of new drugs. We currently know that there are about 30 um, clinical trial, 30 phase three clinical trials that are looking for new agents to, um, to help Alzheimer's. Um, and we know that there was almost close to 200 additional clinical trials. So there is a really huge amount of development in, the, in this area. And, um, having accessible, um, reliable, and um, sensitive enough um, blood-based diagnostic tests can improve um, in inclusion of patients um, and, uh, in, in clinical trials and also lower the cost of the clinical trials, moving again forward the field to the more appropriate um, diagnostics and, um, and therapies. So with that, um, I just wanted to end with um, uh, but kind of a call that this is something that we can't um, do alone and that we are really relying on collaborations with both industry partners but also academic partners to find ways um, to bring the test to the market and to bring the test to the patients um, more quicker than, um, than it was done before. And I think we've, we've talked about ways of not only speeding up the research and development of diagnostics, but evaluating the performance of the diagnostic, the regulatory clearance, and then finally the implementation in, in clinical practice. And for that, we really want to um, work together to make that happen. So thank you.